What's up, everybody? This is Morning Fan Brooke, and welcome to a new stand up talk. And like always, we have a very special guest. And you're going to say, Marnik, you always say that you have a special guest, but it's true because I wouldn't invite you if you weren't special. And the cool thing is, all right, we had Natalie on the show, and she's coming back. I, I keep saying that every episode, but she is coming back. But we have a lady in our presence, which is fun. We had all these men coming around on the stand up talk. Now we have a lady again. That's always a good insight. Ladies rule the world, or how does Beyonce say that? And I'm very honored to have her here. Why? Two reasons. She's, for my, in my opinion, she is one of the best in her job. And you're saying like, oh, you're saying that to every guest. No, she's really good. And I have the honor to call her a very, very good friend. And I am talking about no one else than Lorene Salis. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Lorene. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for how having me. How are you? I'm oh, great. Thank you. You good? It's been a holiday, Christmas holiday, so I'm doing fine. I wanted to say you have like the Christmas costume on, but I think it's a normal sweater, but it has some Christmassy vibes in there. Yeah, it's, you think it would be a coincidence, but it's not. <laughs> it's well thought. <laughs> it's well thought of. And I also see, which I really love, uh, you're probably doing it to, 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 to make me feel good, but it's working. I see the Stand Up to Stand Up book behind you. There it is. <laughs> there it is, people. If you're like, what the hell is a Stand Up to Stand Up book? Go to the website, standupcompany.com and order your copy now and it will change your life. Absolutely. <laughs> She's like, absolutely. <laughs> it was the, the worst gift I ever No, <laughs> no, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, we're really proud to have the book in our closet. So it should be there. There you go. For the rest, I love the background. I, I really need to, I always say that like Niels was Niels Peterman with the last one. And it also had a super cool background. And it says a lot about me that I'm still with the same, what is it, beige background. Look at you, you got the lamp, you got the book, you got the picture, you got the, you had a whole thing going on over here. You do have a Christmas tree, that and is I true. don't, so. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I'm Jolly Holly. Look at this. I'm all. Jolly Holly Christmas vibes. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Of course, we're not just going to talk about backgrounds. Uh, we're going to talk about digital. We're going to talk about social media of everything's happening. It's, it's the number one thing. People listening to the podcast probably got this through Facebook, through Instagram, because they started content on social media. And that's what you do every single day. But before we're going to go in there, like everybody, let's give the people a little introduction to who Lorene is uh, by three simple questions. There's no right or wrong. I just want to see uh, what you would say. I'm curious what, what your, your uh, opinion or your experience is that. We didn't prep this. So you have no clue what's coming, but you can't say anything wrong. It's just your thing. I see your face being like, yeah, <laughs> you're going to ask. It's, it's, it's easy one, easy ones. So I know you're a big Disney fan. Mm -hmm. So choose you could spend what would you what would you rather you could spend the whole weekend at disneyland for free i'll pay all expenses or you get to spend one day with olaf from frozen what would you choose free disneyland or a day with olaf Ooh. um um free disneyland for a week <laughs> Because Olaf will also be there. <laughs> Ooh, good one. Good Got one. you. <laughs> there you go. That, yeah. All right. So that's what. That's why she's being paid the big money. She's already <laughs> messing with the messing with the mind. Okay. Second one. Going global or going viral with a TikTok a TikTok dance or a TikTok song because you're a really good singer. Going global mm. viral, being old Bella Porch Porch. How do you pronounce it? Or winning a social media or digital award well definitely the award the social media award because I, I don't really like my singing and i do like my job and my work so i would prefer an award for my work than rather for my singing i think <laughs> that's nice and if your boss is looking right now you're getting kudos <laughs> no but it's true it's true but it would be nice to go viral no everybody wants to go viral these days we're going to talk about about that in a second and then the last one if you could ask, because you're day to day, you're working with Instagram, you're working with Facebook. If you could ask Mark Zuckerberg right here, right now, one question, I'm bringing him in. He's going to be on the podcast. What would it be? And you get, you get, you get time to think. One question for Zuckerberg. Yeah. Um, if I was Zuckerberg right now, what would you say? Why did you change the little heart on Instagram? I don't know if you noticed, but there's this little pop-up that you can get for all your uh, mentions and notifications. And that's that little heart at the bottom of the app. And they yeah. changed it. They changed it um, with, I think it was the Instagram shopping tab. 
So they changed the likes with the Instagram shopping tab. And I was like, no, <laughs> that doesn't work. So that would be my question. Why did you do it? What's the thought behind it? <laughs> That's a good, I, indeed, because I, I had the same thing. I'm, I'm not as experienced in the Instagram as, as you, but I also had like my, my trusted environment is no longer, mm -hmm. where is everything? Exactly. And from bringing people together and socializing on Instagram, they suddenly go to shopping. That's the prior thing on Instagram. And that's, nah, doesn't work for me. It has to be the likes and the mentions. <laughs> but do, do you, we're already going in an interview, but I think it's an interesting one. Do you really think that's still the, the main idea, bringing people together and having likes, or is it just sell products, sell ads? Well, it should be. I think yeah, the, the first reason why they introduced Facebook was to bring people together and to make the world a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know as a marketeer also, you have to promote your products, promote your services. And sales is often the um, number one reason why you should be on social media. But I think at the bottom line, you just need to bring people together, socialize, give likes, give love, <laughs> because that's the reason why you go on social media in the first place. So, but yeah, it's changing. It's, it's more changing into a sales tool than a communication tool in much cases. Yeah. So you're going to be happy if we organize a digital award event at Disneyland for a week or a weekend and have Olaf give you the prize. Yeah, that yeah. would be that would be it. That would, <laughs> that would be the perfect combination. All right, and he has to be singing. <laughs> he has to be singing and everything will go viral. Very nice. Good answer. Good answer. Thank you very much, Lorene. I think you're ready. Of course, we're going to learn more about you and what you do in the interview. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, if you're excited to see what Lorene has to say about digital social media and you want to learn about content, about going viral or just meeting Olaf in Disneyland, just stick with us for this episode of the Stand Up Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Are you listening? Damn. Okay, welcome back to the Stand Up Talk. We're still with Lorene Salas from Blue Zoo. Uh, how, what do you have to say? So, do I say social media manager? Do I say social media advertising guru, knower of all things online? Or what, 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 what do I call your function? Um, I think they're all correct. Yeah. <laughs> I think in general, a social media manager would do the gist, would be sufficient. <laughs> manager. And that brings me straight into the first, first question because social media manager, I can imagine people listening right now that they know what a social media manager is that says they manage social media. But I still feel also from my experience at PepsiCo when we work with social media and, and, and digital, People thought it was just customer service through Facebook. That's what you do. You just answer annoying questions from people all day for a certain brand or a company, maybe put online a few ads and that's it. But for the people that have no clue what a social management is, is that it or is it more to it? What do you do? Well, it's definitely a little part of it, that customer service. Um, I would say a social media manager is someone or a team who uh, controls the social media channels of a brand or a company. Um, and that mainly means that you're planning, implementing, and managing all the communication on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Um, but I think there are three main aspects that every social media manager should do to become a social media manager. And the um, thing that always starts any management on social media is a strategy. Um, that's also something that's often forgotten that a social media manager doesn't just post everything online and gets likes and goes viral. Yeah. Um, but that strategy really is the first step towards a great uh, management on social media. Um, and that strategy involves creating targets, target groups, KPIs, uh, your tone of voice, your brand identity in social media, um, which channels that you use, which one's prior, which one's not, uh, the frequency of communication. So that mainly is what we always start doing uh, in management is to start with that strategy. And then from the strategy, yeah, you start implementing. So you create uh, content, you create the advertising, um, and that mainly is something that you do on a daily basis. So you create a content planning, you create visuals, videos, uh, the little copy with it, uh, but also the advertising behind it so that we make sure that every single content piece will be advertised the best way to uh, your target group. Right. but also that optimizing that advertisement as well. Um, and then you have that customer service as well. Um, so that, that's what we call community management um, because social media is still in itself social. Uh, it's not just media. It's not just um, a monologue. You have to start a conversation with your target group. Uh, for instance, um, that's just shopping. I just learned that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Um, and the community management is also very important because... Um, 
the thing on social media is that you have a social link and you have to really engage with people um of course with the content and with your campaigns of a brand um, but that managing of incoming comments answers questions is really important for um the overall succeed uh, success of your social media management um and i think that would cover most of that what a social media manager exactly does it's a lot just did you can say manager of all well it's not all <laughs> but it's a lot yeah i i often get the response that as a social media manager oh you should be on facebook every day yeah. and yes and also instagram and also linkedin and it's yeah it's also being on the channels but mostly being on the channels for your clients for your projects um but that's more to it than just posting and getting likes okay. so so if you're a community manager you're really managing the community it's customer service online you're doing of course some more but it's mainly focused on on servicing and then social media manager you're in general yeah you're 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 just guiding a brand or a company online through the content, through the ads, through what target audience. And it's the, what they used to do in, in print and get some advertising going and, and making a brand bigger. That's what you're doing online. If I, if I understand it correctly. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And it's mostly um, our job, I think as a social media manager to control the reputation of a certain brand online, mm -hmm. um, that you really know what you're talking about, know the values of that brand, bring them across in uh, campaigns but also managing their reputation because there are a lot of negative people as well on social media that you really can counter them and make sure that reputation is represented well. Okay, and like Warren Buffett said, oh, here I go again. I tried to do a quote at Niels's episode. I messed it up completely, but Warren Buffett has this, has this quote that it takes, help me out here, it takes, what is it, years to build a reputation and it takes like a couple of seconds to ruin it, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, you're giving, right. you're giving me the same look as Niels did. Like, no, Marty, you messed up the quote. <laughs> you messed up. But something like that. I think also online, one, one slip up as a brand, definitely the big ones. You're under a microscope and one piece of content that is wrong, one comment that is gone, and boom, the whole world explodes. And if you say, so now we know also, now we know what it is to be a social media manager, what you do every day, and it's more than just being on Facebook. And you talk about strategy. You talk about... The, the customer serves during the community management, as you as you uh, called it. But are, are we really doing that in, in general? And you don't have to name clients or whatever, but just in general, if you look at not just your clients, but everything in, in, in companies, are we doing this or are we still in the phases I was in years ago when I was very active on, on social media for, for brands? Like post something online, just, just make it go viral. Dude, that's Make it go brief, viral. Yeah, that's a briefing we got. Are you actually building strategies? Are companies in that phase or are we still in, we have to do something with social, but we don't know what? Well, it can go both ways. I feel like a lot of companies do realize the, the benefit they can gain from social media yeah. and that they do know we have to invest in a social media manager or an agency that covers that for us. Um, but there are also some companies that still don't have still don't, didn't see the exact effect that social media can have. Um, and I think that most companies are still maturing in that phase that they really acknowledge the effect that social media can have, uh, but not every company has seen the effects and how they can bring that um, for their company. Um, but I think, I think in, in general, we can say that a lot of companies acknowledge social media as a specific a specialized skill and you do need to have the right person on the job uh, to do so um but yeah it's it can't go both ways some companies do some companies don't yeah. and is it is it in 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 so you're saying it goes both ways how do you look at the market right now in general because we're, we're living in belgium but pretty much if i i do international conferences every company's bumping into the same things no matter where you are europe us Maybe you have some more budget, maybe less budget, but doesn't really matter. It's the same, same challenges. Where do you see the, the market? Are we still scratching the surface? Are we still like, let's do something with social and just look at how or Oreo is doing it and let's copy that? Or are we really most companies taking, most brands taking the next step? Are we maturing in this or are we, or are we just... Uh, well, I would say that companies are definitely maturing towards investing in social media. Um, they're really seeing that social media is a perfect sales tool as well, but also a communication tool to really engage with their audience. 
Um, something that you really don't have with offline communication or in event communication, you do have it a little bit, but in social media, you can really engage in a conversation and to control the personal impact that you have on a certain um, customer or potential customer. Um, and I really think that companies acknowledge the fact that, that social media can have that effect, that positive effect on your overall brand reputation um, by simply being very active on social media because whatever brand or company that you are, every single or mostly every single customer of you will be present on social media. Um, and, and I think the most companies will uh, invest really well in uh, posting their content, advertising their content. Um, but I think in, in a lot of brands or companies, I still feel that community management is, is not that on point yet. Um, for instance, if you tweet at a certain brand or you ask a question on Instagram, if it takes longer than 24 hours or 48 hours on just work week, yeah, yeah. that is a very long time. And sometimes it's even longer or you have a really standard robotic ag- um, answer. Chatbots. <laughs> Chatbots, for example, um, and I think that's something that a lot of companies tend to forget is that social media is still social. It's still a human way of communicating with your target group. Um, and I think in that case, we're still scratching the service, that really human way of communicating. Um, but being present on social media, posting regularly, um, have an active channel. I think lots of companies do already have that. I think I agree, yeah. It's not my job to agree on everything you say on the box, but I do agree. If I look now, seeing what brands are doing, the content, still, of course, people are struggling, but that's, that's what everything. Um, you will have people that, that, that go further and people that just keep exploring. But I do think that's a really important point also for the people listening. If you want to start with social media, I'm just repeating what you're saying, eh? but that's why I agree and I think it's a really good point. Also, if I look at how I do my current content as my small little stand-up company brand, and back in the day for, for PepsiCo, for the Lays and the, and the 7-Up and the Doritos, is you're always thinking about making content. We had content plans and you had to do two or three posts a day. You had to be creative and you give an agency a lot of money because you can't come up with all the content yourself and you have to go to the factory and make some movies and you have to check it and everybody's like, ah! And then you forget to answer questions online or you're very scared to answer them online. And if I see now in my personal personal branding online on social sometimes a linkedin because linkedin is really important for our business a linkedin comment can get me more business than actually doing a post myself so that's why i think you're really making a good point that sometimes the best comp content is not content itself but just reacting to people's questions or yeah definitely and that's what what you should determine in your social media strategy is of course, what content are we going to bring? Which advertising should we do? But also a very important aspect is that community management. How are we going to answer to people? Will we even answer to people? That's also a very strategic choice to do not to, to not answer those questions. Uh, but also in what tone of voice are we using um, your first name or your last name? How are we ending off our conversation? Is it sincerely or XOXO or whatever, that really tone of voice that you use as a brand? Yeah. Um, should we say um, thank you, have a nice day, XOXO stand up team, or are we going to say XOXO Marnik from Stand Up Company? So that's a really different way of communicating, and that's what the community management is so important that it's, it's just answering questions mainly, but that's also something that you could put your brand into and really make a difference in just answering or answering it with a, th- a bit of your strategy as well. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's funny that you say that because. I, we have a lot of contact with our clients uh, through WhatsApp because it's, it's really easy for them to keep in touch and also easy for us to do. And you notice after a while, even though we really did, we didn't really think about it, we should actually. We just we're just being ourselves, and we can do that because it's just two of us, Natalie and me. I can imagine if you have five hundred people working for you, that's a different case. But if WhatsApp, we are more into the yeah, what's up, awesome. This is Mark Standard, and sometimes I just react in a very professional way, and like. You're right there, Lorene. That's exactly good. Thank you very much and have a great day. Something like that. And then people immediately text back, what's wrong, Marnik? Are you not feeling good? Uh, people get used to that, the, the tone of voice. It's, uh, That's that tone of voice, exactly. 
And that's what makes a difference. Uh, there are also some companies that really choose a certain way of ending their conversations because they know that will start a certain recognition for their brand. Yeah. Um, Sophie from Zalando, for example, um, yeah. everyone knows Sophie. Sophie is not one person. Um, she is a whole team of social media managers, but they chose to have that one specific person, that one specific name to end their conversations with, and also their newsletters um, to really also make that a, a type of branding for their company. But also the thing with the tone of voice is that you can uh, strategize the way you end that conversation. Um, for example, in a lot of projects that we do, we just uh, make up some names. Yeah. Um, so it's not that usual that we answer our um, companies or brands channels with our personal name, but that we just make up um, Anita or Mark or whatever, just someone else so that we can really um, link that name to that brand. And it just also create an identity for um, that human way of communicating in, in those answers and those comments. Yeah, and also when someone's sick, like it doesn't really matter who's behind the buttons. It's just Anita or Sophie everywhere. And you're probably talking to Mark. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah that's such a strategy because a lot of companies do use their personal name or their initials to really um, make it personal as well, but also to really engage with the real person behind it. Yeah. But that's just the strategic choice you'll have to make as a company. You're talking about, okay, the, the market is maturing. You're talking about... You got to get a strategy. It's not just doing social media. You have to know who you're talking to. What are you going to say? What you're talking, even in the smallest details, what's your tone of voice? How are you going to end conversations? And definitely focus on the conversations because it's not just pushing content out. Content can also be the community management, like you call it, reacting, answering, not answering, and the way you are answering it. Do you have, talking about all that, and I can imagine people that are writing down right now, like, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. Maybe I'm putting you on the spot, but what are good examples, maybe brands? And if you don't know brands, what are like the, your three or five rules or guidelines that if you want to dive deep into social media, you want to have the strategy, you want to rock like so free from Zalando, whoever, who does it best? What do you need to do? How can you rock this as a brand? Um well, the first step you should take as a brand is to really know your target group. Um, that's where everything starts is to really know who's in front of me and not just women between the age of 30 and 40, but really defining that person bef that's standing before you. Because um, the better that you can um, give an idea to your target group and to really conceptualize it as a real person, the better you can understand what that person needs. Um, but also make a really tailored advertising model for that specific person so that you know, okay, we'll, we'll have to use this type of visual, this type of content in this language. Uh, we'll have to advertise them this way because we know they're interested in bicycle, in dogs and puppies, whatever. Um, so that really is a start of every step you should take on social media is to define a target group as detailed as possible. Um, then the next step I would say is to um, define a strategy based on that target group. So if you know that the target group is mostly active on Instagram, for example, then you create a strategy for Instagram. What content, what frequency, what tone of voice. Um, and that you should choose to do that for every single channel that fits best for your target group um, or target groups. You'll never have just one, you have a, several of them. Um, and then also that developing that strategy on um, a daily or monthly basis, because I often get the question, of um, how much do you need to post a week, a day, a month? Um, and I always answer, I'd rather have you post one good con piece of content per week, for example, or per month, than to really force yourself in posting every day or posting every week. Yeah. Uh, well, in most cases, it's not necessary to post every single week. It's just whatever fits you and your brand and your target group best, that's that magical uh, mix. Yeah. And to also plan it, um, way in the future so we always plan our content uh, a month before so that we already know what content will we will bring but also to reflect back on that strategy does it fit our target group or not um and then definitely the advertising as well um because you can't really focus on organic reach um sort of free reach that you get from your content so that you really push your content to the right target group at the right time with a certain budget um, and then, of course, last step would be that communication management as well. Um, that you also focus on the feedback that you'll get from uh, from your content. 
Sounds pretty simple, actually, if you sum it up like that. Just produce content, know who you're pushing content to, put some ads under it, community manage it. <laughs> but in real life, it's 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 a full time job. It's a full time job, and it sounds easy, but it's 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 a very analytical way of human communication. It's it's also knowing your target group, knowing the people, but also knowing your metrics and how you can optimize them. So it's it's a back and forth strategy that you keep optimizing, keep implementing again, and just work your best way. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's, it's, it, it links a lot. It's communication in general, like where we're talking about storytelling, about communication. It's, it's making something recognizable. It's making it relatable because you as a brand can think, oh my God, our product or our service is amazing. But what does your target group care about? Like if I relate it to what you just said, to um, what I did in the past, we had some brands that we as a, as a brand team said, oh, this is for the youngsters. This is for the cool kids. And we're going to make ads and we're going to make content about skateboarding and snowboarding because our brand is cool. And this is, this is who our, our, our brand is for. And that's good. You need to know that. But then if you do some research, taxi drivers in Eastern Europe were our biggest target audience. They were really consuming the masses of our product. And we're making skating content on Facebook, Instagram on one hand, and actually who is consuming the product is this 50 year old taxi, <laughs> taxi driver. And there you have to know like, who are we going to target? We're going to make, so you have to make it relatable that I can, uh, I can uh, imagine. And then what you also said resonated with me with the, with the not pushing out too much. Because when we help people with, with their storytelling in general, they find confidence and they're super pumped up and they're like, Marnik, let's do this. I'm going to tell stories online and you help me with this, which is great. That's what we're doing it for. And then they say, I'm going to produce three videos a month. And they were like, good luck with that. Yeah, it goes, goes well for a month and then you're... Yeah. Really and then just... silence. <laughs> silence. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I also, I think there's a really important bond also for the people listening better to, like you said, one piece of content a week or a month, and you can keep that up in the long term instead of just going all out. And then after two months, it's radio silent. Absolutely. The main goal on social media should be your long-term relationship with your customer and not just gaining very fast likes on one post, but really to engage in that relationship. <laughs> And who's, who's doing that right? Do you have like one favorite for you personally, one favorite brand that is, of course, nobody's perfect, but it just really doesn't have to be one of your clients. It's going to just be general global brand that you say that they're, they're taking most of the boxes that you just said. Um, well, of course, our clients. There you go. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, but no, one of my favorites on social media would be uh, bold.com. Uh, the web shop because they're really focusing on creating relatable content and they really define you can, you can tell from their content they really define several target groups from millennials to parents to the boomers to grandparents um, and they really focus on creating really great top of mind awareness and a relationship with their audience mainly focusing on that and not just on conversion sales selling as much products that we can because they already have other tools for that as a newsletters um, or Google advertising, for example, but their social media channels, their Facebook and their Instagram channels are mainly focused on uh, creating that relationship with their customer yeah. through memes, through funny posts, through relatable content, um, and to really also engage with their audience because in most of the time of Spolpen.com um, posts any picture, so say a meme of Game of Thrones, for example, yeah. the meme itself is really on point. It's very relatable and will gain a lot of likes. Yeah. But if you then look in the comments, that's where they're scoring. They're really going on one-on-one -on -one conversations with every single person that answers them. Um, and that's when you really focus on that relationship because if you um, can make a fan or an ambassador of that one single person, one single person at a time, you're really making sure that you have that long-term relationship um, and to really engage in that social human way of communicating. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah. So the, you just tease them, get everybody in there, and then show them there's a human behind it, and really get that conversation going. Yeah, but it's just, for the people that don't know, if you're like listening, for some reason we have a lot of people listening from Spain. If I look at the statistics, so people are listening from Spain right now. Hola. Hola. <laughs> there you go. That's how. That's, no habla here. No habla. But, but ball.com is like this. It's like the Amazon in, in the Netherlands and Belgium. It's really big. Uh, and that's what Lorene is uh, talking about. So yeah, I think uh, 
I think mainly the, a lot of Dutch brands really have have their social media game. If you also look at KLM, the the, the Royal Airline, they're also doing good stuff. So definitely, yeah. But also in in Belgium, we have uh, the Telenet Orange, um, just the tele company. They are also very um, aware of that community management, but mainly that customer service, yeah. because you will get a quicker answer on Twitter than you should gain on on uh, by sending an email, for example. Yeah. I even have my parents and my grandparents, when they have a problem with those brands, ask me to ask the question for them because they know they're not going to get a fast answer on the phone. And they're just like, Marnie, can you go on that Twitter tweet thing and just ask them what's wrong with my, <laughs> with my internet? And indeed, within a couple of minutes, you get, uh, you get the, the answers. Now, you were talking about, I hope you wrote, wrote them down uh, for the people that are listening, what it is or what boxes you need to take to... Be good on social and there's no magic recipe but indeed if you know your target audience you can relate you can build content or you can have an agency build content for you you put some advertising advertising behind <laughs> it um, and you do <clears throat> it will start working easier said than done and if you then look at your target audience of course the logical thing to say would be in the social media landscape right now with facebook instagram i'm gonna put WhatsApp and Messenger also in there. Uh, TikTok, you have the, still the blogs going on. You have the Reddit forums. It's all social. It's all there. People communicating with each other. Even though if you know your target audience, how as a brand or company or marketeer do you choose the channel to be on? Because the moment something pops up, like for example, everyone, oh, Instagram, let's focus on Instagram. Instagram is big right now. We need to be there. And then all of a sudden, hi, I'm TikTok. I'm super popular right now. Maybe just with the youth, but everybody's coming here. So you also need to focus on me. And every marketer explodes because of like, oh, another channel. <laughs> do you need to be everywhere or not? And how do you choose? Well, you don't need to be on every single channel. It's also something that we address to our clients. Um, it's not because everyone's on TikTok that you as a brand also need to be on TikTok. Um, well, I'll have to repeat myself and, and say, well, your target group comes first. So you really have to know who you're talking to, but mostly on which channels your target group is active most. Um, and especially active, not just um, the, in the way of numbers, not just in um, their, well, for example, eight year olds or more more 18 roles or on Facebook and on Instagram, but they're more active on Instagram. So that also makes a difference. Um, but really defining a target group is the first step into choosing the right channel. Um, and in most cases, what we do, for example, for uh, the companies that we work for is to create a, set, a strategy for every single channel. And when you're developing that strategy, so that means that you're defining your content, defining your advertising um, and your advertising groups, um, you will, quickly stumble on the, um, the effects of difference between the, the channels. Because if you can't reach your target group on Snapchat, for example, then you already know, okay, we don't need Snapchat. There's not a value on Snapchat for our brand. Um, but in most cases, you, you would say, I, I think Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, for example, or LinkedIn, and then you just start communicating along with your strategy and you will quickly see there's a difference between the metrics um, on Facebook, for example, than on Twitter, that you gain a lot more followers or um, clicks to your to website or um, comments on Facebook than you do on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And you also just have to take a step back and look again at your strategy to make sure is Twitter still a valuable channel for us or, or do we just need to focus on Facebook and Instagram? Um, and it's also a very logical step for every company is just to decide, okay, we, we're not using Twitter anymore. It's not valuable for us. Uh, we're not gaining anything from it and we just scratch it from a channel mix. Um, and that you just focus your efforts and your budget on the channels that you do know that work for you. But it's definitely not necessary to be active on every single uh, channel. Just what works best for your brand, for your identity and for your uh, target groups. Isn't it then really exhausting if you have a brand that targets young people because well the very young people yeah because one moment you're like oh we're on snapchat okay we're good now we're good oh there's tiktok let's move to tiktok and then yeah if your target group is a target group that really fits snapchat then you 
yeah, you don't have a choice. You have to introduce TikTok as well um, because yeah, they're just mainly the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's also very important in your strategy that it's not just a fixed document and that's just the way it is uh, because that's something I find really interesting in social media management is that it always keeps evolving. Um, it doesn't mean that your strategy works this year in 2020, that it will also work in 2021. Because for a while, we, you know, maybe a second TikTok comes along and then you have to change everything up again. Um, but it really, no matter what happens in the market, you always have to focus on a target group and on the, um, yeah, at the effects, the positive effects you can gain from every single channel towards your brand, but also towards your relationship with your uh, client or target groups. There you go. There you go. And you keep hammering it. So I think it's, it's really important. It's what the target group, what are they doing? How can you relate? And is that, if I'm mistaken, is that the key to maybe potentially go viral being so aware of your target group that you make so relatable comments and content that it has the opportunity or the, the chance to go viral? Is that the key? Well, I was laughing because I thought, well, he went there, he dropped the viral bomb. Yeah. <laughs> I dropped the viral bomb. <laughs> you dropped the viral bomb. Yeah. No, uh, I think it's funny because I think every single social media manager will somehow, in, in, in what step of their career they are, they will get the question, can you go make it viral? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's not a, a secret button that you can push and then it can go viral. Um, because I think luck has to do a lot of, with it as well, um, mainly just by creating viral content. Um, if you just take a look at my TikTok account, I went viral twice and I still don't know why. <laughs> um, there was one video that I um, I reached 1.3 million views with it, I think. Um, it was just a video of a small coin falling through some kind of maze or dispenser. Um, and then all of a sudden 1.3 million views um, with an account that I barely even used at the time. So I have no idea why I, went viral that day um, and the yeah. second time I went viral there was um, a one-liner from the movie She's the Man I don't know if you it. The man. yeah it doesn't ring a bell so it's a very well-known one-liner um, okay. but th this was a one-liner that was going viral at a, well, at a certain time already on TikTok yeah. so I had the feeling if I do something with that quote it might go viral um, um, because that trend was to share your favorite movie quotes and Normally, you should reenact that quote, but yeah. I just taped the video of the movie itself, and then it suddenly went viral again. Um, so in that way, I kind of knew why it would go viral, because it was on trend and it was relatable towards um, the TikTok community. But in most cases, especially with the little coin, I didn't know what triggered that going viral. Um, so to, yeah, I would say luck has a lot to do with it to go viral as well, but also, as you mentioned before, um, mostly in marketing campaigns, that word relatable is very important so that you have to create content that is relatable for your target audience and they will know exactly the emotion that you put out with that um, piece of content. There you, go. Um, you don't have to underestimate the coin fetish people. You know, there are millions <laughs> and millions of people <laughs> just watching coins fall in a machine. And that's, uh, I know the funny thing with your quote, pre people probably thought like, hey, this is actually a really great impersonation of, of the movie. Uh, so you did, but like you said, relatable, a bit of luck um, there and firewall probably shouldn't be the goal, but everybody, yeah. It's fun if you can say like you 1.3 million on one post. Yeah, even if you can't explain it, it's nice to say. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think for as far as marketing campaigns go, um, because we receive that question quite a lot to, on how to make something go viral. Um, and I always say that everything you do as a marketeer starts with a great idea. So you always have to have a great idea of content that you should bring that is relatable, that is on point with your target group. Um, but that idea also has to have a great execution. So if you don't execute it well, your idea won't be as relatable as you can be. Um, it won't work after all. Um, I, maybe a stupid um, example, but I don't know if you've seen um, the Beans and the Astronauts commercial. The Beans and the Astronauts commercial. No, but it, it triggered my curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, a, it's a stupid uh, commercial for uh, Beans, but it's a, it's a scene where there are astronauts fighting some kind of monster. And there's one astronaut that's hiding behind a rock so that the monster can't see them. And then he suddenly farts and <laughs> the monster hear the fart. So they... So he knows where the astronaut is because 
uh, and that video went viral because it was just so funny, so relatable. Because if you yeah. eat beans, you got a fart. Yeah. <laughs> so that that little idea was executed really well for the simple product that's just as beans. Um, but it went viral because of that great idea, that great execution, um, and a very relatable content as well. I'll drop you the link so that you can. Yeah, and yeah, I will, I will put it. We'll put it uh, in the description of the podcast. You choose Spotify. Doesn't matter. We'll put it there. So yeah, there you go. Everybody farts. Beans, beans, yep. and magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you too. That's what they always say. Yeah, it's a stupid example of going viral with relatable content. Um, but also, as you mentioned, going viral is not necessarily a goal that you should have as a brand because there are a lot of viral videos that are all viral and people are laughing with it, with it and keep sharing it with it. Um, but they simply forget the brand behind that viral video. And then it just, your whole campaign falls apart because you can't really uh, know the brand that was behind it or the product that was behind it. In the case of the beans, it's very straightforward and you're using the beans in your content to make the joke. And that's why it's uh, very relatable, but also viral in a good way because you still know the product behind it. Yeah, that's good. That's a good. This also with, with the normal TV commercials, having the balance between funny relatable or too funny to relatable and it's like ha, ha ha i have no clue what it's about yeah it's, uh, yeah or it's or it's just viral or funny because of because of the joke but not because of your product or that your product is not used in the right way yeah. so going viral shouldn't be your number one goal because you tend to forget the, the reason why you're communicating communicating in the first place yeah so so should we see viral maybe we should see viral as the reward you get as a content marketer or social media manager or a brand for doing all the steps right. Because you probably knew your target audience, you made something relatable, you probably engaged with them so that the, the, the got picked up. Maybe you put some advertising behind it. You you were on trend with what the community was already doing. And as a reward, you go viral because you ticked all the boxes. Yeah, and a bit of luck sprinkled yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. There's always a bit of luck. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, two questions that triggered trigger um, me. What you're saying right now is one. I have the feeling, but I could be wrong, that a lot of people have the perception that if they go to a social media agency or they go to you, that the first thing they do, correct me if I'm wrong. This is totally assumption from my part. Hearing you say I got some videos that went viral. Hearing you say I'm on Twitter, I'm on TikTok, I'm experimenting. That people come to you and say, ah, Lorraine, you say that you're a social media manager. You say that you know it all. You, go, you went on the Stand Up Talk podcast and you talked about digital because you're the guru. Um, and then I check your accounts. And how come you do not have 1 million followers on Instagram? How come you are not blue dot checked certified on Twitter? Can you be a good social media manager if you're not going viral? Or, or, or let's quit the viral world. Or you're, you're rocking it online. Well, of course, um, social media, as, as being a social media manager, is your job to, to create very great content and campaigns towards a brand or for a company. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that in my private life, I also use my tricks <laughs> to, go, to go viral or to gain a lot of followers. Um, it's just a choice that you make to, to really invest your time on social media on your daily work basis and not in your private time uh, on your personal channels. Yeah, yeah, it's not really linked between what you do at, at your job for the brands, but and that you do on your personal channels. True. I think also for time wise, if I looked at what I did back in the day when it was it was more into social doing it for the brands, it's a full time job. If you're an influencer and your job is living off YouTube content, my God, you have to you have to spend a lot of time on there. And if you have to do that for I don't know how many brands you're currently working for. Do you still have time to do do your own channels? Well, it's also be, yeah you you're online every single day for your brands or for your companies. That uh, it's just nice to have a little break from social media uh, in your free time. So my social media is really something that I just use to follow other people and to up, once in a while post anything. But it's not that I want to gain new followers or gain clients through my social media. Uh, because as you say, it's a full-time job and you're also focusing eight hours a day on social media for your uh, clients. So it's not really necessary to also be an influencer on the side because you really don't have the time to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. But what would be cool, like, Laureen, after this podcast, man, 
it's gonna go viral. <laughs> You're gonna be an influencer. <laughs> Hashtag just woke up like this. Um, I watch too much Instagram. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the second question I had. Um, well, on what you're saying right now when we're talking about TikTok, choosing it in your function, the channels, being there. Where's the landscape in general going? Is there still room for, for new channels? Because now you have TikTok. Snapchat came and it's still there, but I have the feeling, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's, that it's dying. Uh, you have Facebook not buying brands, but they're copying everything. So if TikTok does something, it goes into Instagram. If Snapchat does something, it goes into Instagram. Where's the market going? Or is it just going to be Zuckerberg rules everything or? Well, I think there's still room for other channels um, because I think no one saw TikTok coming or at least I didn't. Um, so I think there's also always room for another channel. Um, but the thing is with Snapchat, there was something new. They created those face filters. They created short chats of with photos with the snaps. Um, and that was something new. That was something that didn't exist in Facebook at the time. Um, so they were bringing something new towards the market and it just worked. It clicked with the younger audience. But as you mentioned, of course, uh, Instagram bought uh, the same uh, principle with the Instagram stories. Uh, but there was room for Snapchat to enter that market because they brought something new as well with TikTok. Oh, although TikTok might have some Vine influences uh, within it, but there was room for TikTok because it was something new. It was a very new way of communicating um, in that short amount of videos. Um, and also the, the algorithm of TikTok at first was to really go viral in just like a second. Um, and that was also very interesting and something new um, that they would bring in the market that Facebook or Instagram didn't have at the time. Now they introduced Reels. It's kind of the same as TikTok. It's not really um, the same as TikTok. It, it works in a different way. Um, but that also shows that if Instagram or Facebook is buying that type of feature in your um, yeah. app, that means that you brought something new to the market. Yeah. And I think as long as, as new channels can bring something new or something engaging or a way of video or filters, filters. or whatever, um, but there will still be room for, for new channels. Um, plus, I also have a feeling that Facebook might shift towards just being there and not really doing anything anymore so that they really are going to focus their um, most of their energy on Instagram because Instagram is, is booming in, in comparison to Facebook. So that maybe Facebook will, will go to the background and another platform can, can come forward again. So we'll have to see, but I think that there's definitely some room left for, for new challenges. Yeah, but of course, you don't have a glass ball, so I'm not expecting you to say, well, in the next coming years, this and this needs to happen, <laughs> because then you will be super rich, and you'll probably invent the next uh, the next new TikTok yourself. Well, if I could, I would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would all be, remember the little people once you're up there, uh, <laughs> with the Elon Musks of this world. Okay, so, so what you're saying is there will be room, uh, as long as you bring something new to the table, and as you said before, don't panic as a brand, it doesn't mean that if everybody unless you have a, a brand for youngsters uh, you don't have to jump on everything just jump on the things that actually work work for you now if you look at tiktok i can imagine that the people that are listening right now it's the number one question tiktok what do and you answered it already a bit because you have to look at your target audience and i'm going to make you say it again uh, because you're like stop asking me the same questions but tiktok is the number one question should we start experimenting where is it going what is it doing Let's say that I have a brand that is, yeah, could be interesting for TikTok. Where is it at right now? Should I do it? Should I wait? Should I experiment? Does it already offer me things for, for brands to create something to advertise? Or are we still in taking baby steps? Um, well, there are some Belgian brands that really are succeeding on TikTok. Um, and my advice would be um, to launch your brand on TikTok is to really take a step back, create a strategy first, um, but to really, um, yeah, to really make a great strategy in what content you would bring. Um, because TikTok is a very active channel. It's more active than Instagram and Facebook, for example, um, that you have to post almost daily to really gain some uh, reach and followers. Um, so you really have to take a step back and look at your brand and discover if you do have enough content to create to last a month or let's say two months to post every day, every single day, maybe even two 
um, pieces of content a day um, to really make sure that you can create a large community on uh, TikTok. Um, so that will be my first step to create that strategy and what content do we have and what content is relatable enough for a target group to bring on TikTok. And if the answer is no, if you can't figure out more than 10 ideas to create a TikTok account, then you probably shouldn't be on TikTok. Okay. Um, to really make sure that you have a full uh, plan on your content that you can last a month or two months um, to really engage in that community. Um, maybe to give you some examples, um, because you have to start with your target group, as you mentioned before. So you really have to create creative and authentic, but mostly relatable content towards your target group. Um, and if you look at Netflix, for example, um, they really create relatable content based on their product the movies, the series on Netflix, and they they use great scenes or iconic quotes or, or famous one-liners in their series and movies that they really push forward on TikTok as well, because they know that their target group, all the viewers will only pick up on those great scenes or those great one-liners. That's the thing that resonates after you've seen the movie or after you've seen the series. And that's the way that they keep engaging with their community because they know people like how you do it by Joey and friends, and they use that in their content. Um, as well as favorite, um, uh, favorite scenes or, or uh, very well-known quotes from, um, let's say, The Crown, for example. Yeah. They really use that because they know that's what uh, our target group is looking for and that's what they will pick up. Um, the same goes for the San Diego Zoo on TikTok. Um, San Diego Zoo. Zoo. Now it gets interesting. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a zoo. Here we go. Does it include farts? No, it does not okay, include no, yeah, go ahead, It does include animals uh, because they know everyone who visits a zoo, a real zoo, not a social media agency. Um, the thing that you don't see in a real zoo are the behind the scenes because you, you, you see the animals and you see the cages that they live in, but you don't see how they um, are taken care of, how other people are working together with those animals. Um, even close-ups, for example, for a rhino, you can't really go any closer than the cage, but yeah. with the TikTok and the people that take care of that rhino can really film the nose, the eyes of that rhino. And that's what makes it interesting because they know that if you visit a zoo or any zoo, you don't really get the full experience, but, but they bring that experience and that emotion in their content on TikTok. Um, and they also introduce, introducing um, how to's close up behind the scenes, but also young new animals uh, that they gain in the zoo. And that's also a very, specific way in how to um, bring their product or service towards TikTok audience because they know that's not what you see in a regular zoo and that's what we'll bring on TikTok. The same goes for Formula One uh, page, yeah. the Max Verstappen fan club. Um, they are also on TikTok because when you, um, you watch a certain race or you even go to see a race, um, you can not see the emotion of the drivers or you can not see how they relate to each other or the jokes that they make or the, the little in-between breaks that they that they make. Um, and that's a very clever trick to also use TikTok in that case because they know all those behind the scenes and those little emotions, the jokes, um, for stop it tells Hamilton, for example, you don't get that if you're just viewing the race, but if you bring that on TikTok content, um, then you also have that relatable content for your audience. And that's just a clever way that those three um, brands use TikTok to really skyrocket their community on TikTok because they know this is what they what the people want, uh, but they really know that this is a way that you can all they can use an on-trend channel in their advantage um, towards that relatable content for their target audience. That's a good one. The the the, the zoo and, and and the the F1 and there, I think it's also important one for for people listening that sometimes. You, you, you think to yourself when you're running a company and you do online, like, where am I going to get all that content? I'm not, a, I'm not a creative machine. And then you say to San Diego, I don't know their account, but I can imagine what you're saying. They're just filming backstage, what's going on, how we're taking care of the animals. Bomb. Contents for months. Formula Absolutely. One. The, the whole Netflix uh, sur Drive to Survive documentary, which was super successful. It's just cameras following drivers around. And like you said, making jokes, arguing, uh, having discussions within the team, bomb content for for years or so. Yeah, exactly. There's even a funny uh, account that I follow is uh, One Minute Board Games. I think it's an online shop or, or actual shop somewhere in America, I think. But they have a TikTok account to introduce all the board games that they have. 
within the 30 or 60 seconds of a TikTok video. And that's just brilliant. They have a full store of all board games. Nice. But they, I think they now have millions of followers just because they're explaining every single board game that they have in their store. And of course, they have a lot of content. It's just sitting in their closet waiting yeah. to be yeah. <laughs> to go on TikTok. So, um, but it's very important to really create that relatable content around your product or service um, and then make a lot of content on TikTok. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, I think that's something I also hear people saying that are really into TikTok. It's like make a lot of content. And we've discussed before, try to make on social one piece of content a week. Uh, try not to overdo it so you can keep it up. But like you said, on TikTok, because it's so short, just produce, 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 produce. Absolutely. Just as many as you can make. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's but good. I'll also put the, the links in there. We have the San Diego Zoo. We have the Formula One drivers. We have the one minute board games. Uh, good stuff. And then looking at the time, don't want to take too much of your time. We have already discussed a lot. A um, couple of more things I want to dive into is if you look at TikTok, if you look at what is working, a lot of good content, and it's not that I'm falling asleep here. I'm just trying to, <laughs> to, to rethink my, how I'm going to ask this as clear as possible. If you look at what's working online, a lot of content is also being created by the community, by content creators or influencers, if I can call them like that, but it's a dirty word, influencers. Um, what's the best way for a brand these days to go? Because if I look at, for example, Gymshark, Gymshark came out of nowhere in an already oversaturated market of, of fitness gear and they boomed. And how did they did? They used certain influencers or people, micro influencers doing fitness. They gave them their clothes, they paid them some money, they made the content and now they're a multi-million dollar brand. Same with the ocean spray on TikTok because we're talking about TikTok. You have this guy on a skateboard drinking ocean spray and boom, the man goes, goes viral, ocean spray jumps in on and it's the best campaign they probably ever did, even though they didn't do it. How do you look at content creators, influencers? What role do they play? Do you need to use them as a company or a brand in function, of course, your target audience and your strategy? Or is it an oversaturated market? Is there an ROI or is it just a waste of money? Well, I think that influencers still have their value because yeah, it is a dirty word in some cases because influencers tend to be fake a lot these days um, because a, a real good influencer that really can be beneficial towards your brand has to be authentic and sincere. Um, and a lot of influencers, mainly the, the, the influencers that maybe introduced the last two years or three years, for example, they don't have that uh, authenticity just yet, um, that they just take a lot of campaigns as much as they can to, to make as much money as they can. Um, but the real influencers are the ones that really stick to their own brand identity. Let's say uh, they have their own values and they also turn down campaigns that they only um, create content for, for brands or for products that they really believe in. And that's the thing that makes an influencer communication really valuable because it's an honest opinion and the followers of the influencers know that that influencer really is sincere and honest about what they're selling and what they're not selling um, so that you really have a strong connection with their followers um, to have that level of honesty in their communication. And that's the difference between a really great influencer campaign and the ones that don't work if it's just too superficial and doesn't involve an influencer that really has that sort of relationship with their followers. So if I, if I would, for example, pose in my swim shorts with a bag of tea, that would be not the right, <laughs> the right influence. <laughs> That's most of the time what we associate. But like, you, so you're saying they're, they're useful, they're valuable, as long as they themselves know exactly who the target audience is, what their brand is, what they stand for, uh, or else you just have a person that is trying to make a quick buck. Exactly. And the, and the most influencers, I think, or the best influencers really have their number one focus is to create a community around them. Mm -hmm. And those campaigns or that little products that they can um, advertise on their channels is just something that came along with it, because their number one focus was to create that community and to create that sort of environment and relationship mm -hmm. with their followers. Yeah. And that was, that's, in my opinion, what makes a great influencer um, a good influencer is because their number one focus is not on 
making money. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, so it's still useful to do and it's still, uh, still go over to write. And of course, if someone picks up your brand and does something, well, like you said, it's just the sprinkles of luck that you get that someone sprinkles takes, of luck. Yeah, takes a skateboard and does the ocean spray. And you're like, oh my God, best thing we ever did. Uh, exactly. All right. And then using influence is one thing because I, like, like I'm smoothly moving into talking about money. So influencers, then, then you can send product, but sometimes you have to pay them. And you also talked about advertising. Am I right to say, because we had a chat before this, this before you started the, the, the episode about the advertising and you already mentioned that you need to do it as one of your ticking the boxes, making social media work. Where are we at right now? Do you, can you still create content and make a dent as a brand if you do not put money behind it or has, like we discussed in the beginning, you say that they changed the heart to a shopping button or is social media becoming, if you do not advertise like you did on TV, back in the day, you're done. doesn't really matter. You have to put money. Are we all hooked to the, to the how do you say that? The money-making machine. The money-making <laughs> machine. Are we just, do we need to pour in money to, to make a dent online or is that too extreme? Um, well, I think in, in some cases, Advertising is necessary um, because there's a difference on, um, let's say, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter as well, um, between organic reach and paid reach. Organic just means free, that you just mainly post a picture, for example, and the reach that you gain from just posting and the likes that you'll get is just the organic reach. Um, but in most cases, the organic reach is not that impressive. Um, you will keep creating the same Um, if you have the relatable content for your target audience, but the same people are commenting and liking on your post, your mom, your dad, yeah. your colleagues, for example, um, but you're really not gaining reach a new perspective or a new people, uh, or you're not even reaching your target audience. In worst case, they don't even know you exist and that you're creating that, that very valuable content. Um, so that organic reach, it really just isn't enough for most brands to really reach that target audience and to bring their message across. For us, uh, paid advertising, it's really beneficial because you can determine your exact target group you want to reach. Um, you can easily say between uh, eight and uh, nine o'clock, I want my advertisement to show to people with interest in puppies and mm. football, for example. You can really determine the content towards the target group of who will see it, when they see it, and on which channel they will see it. Uh, and that's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very positive thing for media to to use in that case, because you will also get immediate feedback from your advertisement. So if, let's say if you put 10 euros behind a certain campaign, after the first sense, you already know if it's working or not. You will know the return on ad spend, we call it, um, the immediate feedback from your metrics that you know, okay, this content really is relatable to a target you or it isn't. And that's the only way that you can really determine if your strategy is working towards your target audience, so that you know those metrics you'll see a difference between the cost per click, for example, the click towards your website, if that piece of content is working or if it's not working. Um, so that paid advertising in most cases really is necessary to, to not only gain reach, but to gain the right reach for your um, message and your target group. Yeah, and it's, it's, like you said, it can be very frustrating to work on a video or a piece of content really hard and then you just post it online. And I can imagine people listening right now, you're like, you're so proud and you worked on it and you post it online and then besides your mom and dad, which is great, uh, and maybe your grandparents that accidentally liked it, you're like, what? All that time and all that effort for nothing? So then you do 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 the advertising. And you said like put 10 euros behind it. Is it that cheap advertising? Can you really make social media dent with 10, 10 euros? Um, well, 10 euros should be a start uh, amount, but uh, it depends on the channel that you choose. For example, Facebook and Instagram um, is a lot cheaper than advertising on LinkedIn, for example, but it's just another way of working. LinkedIn is an other different audience and different you know, forests and, and all that. Yeah. Um, but every time I say that you, you have to use your advertising budget on social media, people always tend to think like it's thousands of thousands yeah. of euros. Yes. It's not. Uh, we have also a lot of uh, clients that we work for that just have 100 or 200 euros per month, for example, that they invest in social media to mainly just boost their content to the right target audience and to create very dedicated campaigns. 
um, for sales or conversions, um, depending on what strategy that they have. But it's not that you just that you have to invest a lot of thousands of euros. It's just start small, see what the impact is, and optimize your campaign uh, based on the metrics mm -hmm. that you receive from that campaign. I really like the fact that you said just put the money behind it. it doesn't have to be that thousands, thousands of euros, and that it gives you insight using the metrics in is this actually working or not? And if we're talking about the relatability, you're talking about knowing your audience, bringing the right content, the better the content, if I understand it correctly, the better the content, the less you're going to pay because the social media channel, Facebook, for example, will say, uh -huh, this is good content, it's working, so I'm going to push it more so you pay less um, to reach them because everybody's liking it. More or less, it's it's mainly if you invest your um, budget on your certain piece of content, um, the better it fits your target group, the more cost efficient it will be. There you go. Um, so more people within your target group will click on it or will like it because it's so relatable because they really resonate with the message within it. Um, but if it's not, then you instantly see it in the result because you will be paying too much money for just one click or just one like. And then you instantly know, okay, this video just doesn't work. No harm done. Just cancel the advertisement. Try again later next week with a different video, with a different advertising strategy, and just try again with the remaining nine euros of your first 10, for example. And sprinkle some luck on it, and you have yourself <laughs> a viral. <laughs> Stop with the viral. <laughs> yeah, I must only use these powers to annoy. <laughs> right. we're, we're almost ready. I got three, three more questions for you, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. One, and that's why I popped up the viral again, because there's, I think this is also a question, maybe not, but this is also a question they're going to say, oh, and also the social media manager, community managers listening right now are going to be like, oh, here we go again. If we're talking about advertising, if we're talking about putting money behind it, if we're talking about doing all that effort that you talked about, even if you outsource it to a company like what you're working for, Blue Zoo, and you hire your social media managers, or you do it internally yourself, and you have like ball.com or Amazon, you have your internal teams, whatever. A lot of time, a lot of money, even though you can do it for 10 euros. What's the ROI of everything that we do on social media? And I'm saying that because I think that's really, I just say that one of these questions, like how can you go viral? What is the ROI? But it's something I think a lot of companies are still struggling with. What is my return on investment? Can I earn money on social or is it just fun for my reputation that someone's engaging with my movie quote? Well, it depends on the strategy that you have as a brand on social media. There are a lot of brands that really have the focus on driving as much conversions as they can. And that, and that way, the, um, the ROI is really, that really specifically uh, measurable because you exactly know um, what budget will deliver what type of uh, conversion. Um, so if your strategy is to generate conversions, it's really measurable and you just know black on white what your ROI is and what the difference is that you're making on social media. But there are also a lot of companies um, also that we work for that have a real clear strategy that they don't necessarily want to sell anything on social media, but that they just want to focus on a long-term relationship with their community or their audience. Yeah. Uh, because they know that we have a really great brand, we generate enough sales already um, thanks to our normal yeah. communication, TV commercials, uh, brochures, event communication, that their focus on social media is mainly just engaging with their audience. And that's a difficult or a more difficult way to, to measure it because you, yeah, you can measure it in number of followers, in number of comments that you get, the likes, the engagement rates, uh, but it, that's not a direct return on your investment. That's just a long-term uh, tool that you can invest in to make sure that your clients are not just your clients, but also ambassadors, your fans, and really engage in that relationship. So it's really depending on what your focus is on social media and what you want to gain from it and how to define that return on investment. Are they, that's, that's, that's good, sorry, that's a good answer, yeah. Look at it, like what is my, what is my goal? Relationship or can I have, for example, an e-commerce web shop and can really convert it in, into a sales, like ball.com for example, because they sell like Amazon everything. That's an easy conversion. Yeah, it's a good one, I think. Yeah, the, maybe we underestimate as in general, we as people or company or entrepreneurs, maybe underestimate the value of building a relationship with someone. Because it might not be today, but like I said, we, we met each other in a first interview so many years ago. 
did I get any return out of it? I got published in a, in, a, in a school magazine, which is great. You got a return. Hopefully you got good grades. So your return on investment was, but there was a relationship. And like now years later, what we've done for each other, uh, what we've been to each other, we've been to Disneyland together. So the return on investment is now paying off six years later on. So that's the, the power of relationships. So I, I really like that. And like Gary V said so many years ago, what's the ROI of your mother? If you really want to ask that, that question, but I do think yeah. with the rise of e-commerce, definitely more and more people are able to really measure that conversion straight away into a, into money. Absolutely. And maybe something else to, to make sure that community management is also something that people will recognize from this. Um, because the best thing that can happen to a social media manager is when the community takes over, when shit hits the fan. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. So you also focus on creating that relationship with your community to make a fan base and to make a lot of ambassadors for your brand. Because uh, we've seen it in campaigns that we that we ran is that when there's a basher or someone that's really negative or there's a really negative review amongst all the other positives, yeah. you can quickly see that the community is defending the brand. And that's something as a social media manager that you know of and okay, we did our job the right way. This is yeah. paying off. This is really making a difference in the whole uh, journey that we went through on making that community is really paying off because now we don't have just clients. We don't have recurrent clients. We have ambassadors and they defend our brand because they believe in it because they know that we, um, we brought the message across right and they really resonated with it. And now they're defending the brand when things go south, for example. And that's something really important also that social media can have for your brand is that you can really focus on ambassadors and to create a community that stands behind you no matter what. Oh, that's good. If that is not return on investment, having someone stand up for your brand and say, well, Mr. Troll, go away because we'll protect. That's that's the most beautiful. I think that's the most beautiful thing. Then you know, I think if I was a brand manager, that would be like, yes, we've succeeded in our social media game. Yes, exactly. And it also shows in really tiny things. For example, Christmas, we had... I think mainly on all our channels of our clients had a Merry Christmas post, yeah. but not on all channels just yet. We received also feedback. And in the channels that we've been managing for a couple of years now, we really have engaged in a really large community, but it, it's a really nice feeling to also to, uh, towards us as a social media manager, but also to uh, bring forward to our clients is that the community is wishing us a Merry Christmas back. It's go. really something stupid, but then you know that you really have created a relationship. And yeah. those people on Facebook, on Instagram, they do know that there's a person behind the brand, but they're really talking towards the brand. And that's what makes it really important that you're not selling at that point. You're not driving conversions. You're really focusing on a conversation and a relationship. And it shows in a simple, have a Merry Christmas <laughs> to yours, you too. Um, but then you know you're really investing in that community and really in engaging in that community yourself. And I could already see it in your face and the way you're, you're saying it right now that it already sparks some happiness in just <laughs> talking about it and, and getting those Christmas wishes. So that's also the beauty, I think, of a social media manager that when, when you're getting to that point and people wishing you Merry Christmas back, you're like, all right, good part of it. And I also think a, a side note from my part is, is isn't that what, what it's all about? Also in general, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I hear... Like I said, this is my own assumption. A lot of brands fearing social media for the bad, for the trolls, for the bad reputation. What if we mess up? What if you say something wrong? What if our content is not good? But if hearing what you're saying right now, I think you should start in general with what people, most people are good. Most people have good, most people want to wish you a Merry Christmas if they love the brand. And we focus so much on those one or two trolls that are really frustrated that we forget that there's, a mass of people that just want to engage with you and just have fun with your brand. Absolutely. And of course, they're all, they're all trolls and they're all bashers, but it's also the responsibility of the social media manager to embrace those trolls because in nine of 10 cases, those trolls really have a certain problem or question that you as a social media manager really can resolve. So it's mainly just takes a human connection and a human answer towards that troll to really ask, okay, can I help you with anything? Is there something that we can do? Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to call anyone or do you want an email address for a client service, for example? Mm -hmm. And mo in most cases, when you embrace a certain troll or a pressure, in best cases, not all cases, you can convert them 
not into a fan or ambassador, but at least a positive minded person yeah. won't be bashing on your channels anymore. And that's also a very important step in that social media management that you embrace negativity as well, but as, take it as a, as a tool to make sure that your brand identity steps forward in those negative comments as well. Um, to, to launch a stupid quote maybe, but never waste it. Never waste a good crisis. There you go. At least you know your quotes. Look at me. I, I know my, it's from Churchill. There you go. Point but, from green. Yeah, because yeah, we always always have that that feedback as well our clients when we we launch a new campaign or a new uh, channel. That immediate feedback that we get from clients is what if there's negativity? What if there's bashers? But just the way you control those bashers and also develop a strategy in your um, first steps of making um, the campaign is to really know how to control those bashes and what you will do or do not uh, answer to those questions. Yeah. That's good. That's a, like a positive note. Is I'm feeling holly jolly. I just noticed it myself <laughs> that I'm still wearing my hat. But I think this is a nice Christmas message. Like never waste a good crisis. Uh, convert those trolls into something positive. Maybe not fans, but just in general. And yeah, in general, when the community stands up for you, and defends you and, and, and spreads the word for you, then, then yeah, that's, that's the most beautiful thing you can have in social. I think, uh, nice. I hope you're up. I hope if you're listening, write this down. I hope you're writing it down because this is just a, is this becoming this podcast episode is becoming a how to guide to rock social media in general. So even though Lorene will be out of a job after this episode, because you know how to do everything yourself, <laughs> still very, very grateful for all the insights you're giving. Like I said, three last questions. You already answered one. This one is going to be really short because I don't want to make a depressing ending, but I think we need to touch upon it real quick. You saw The Social Dilemma on Netflix, right? The documentary. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Social Dilemma on Netflix. I don't have any shares or stock in Netflix, but I think it's a really confronting documentary. Of course, every documentary you have to take with a grain of salt because it's, it's most of the time extremes. Uh, but you can also always take something from it. And in general, The Social Dilemma, if you don't know it, it's a documentary about the dangers of social media, privacy-wise, but also that social media in general is guiding our thoughts, our opinions, and it's causing a lot of, yeah, problems in the world with elections and, and things like that because it's being controlled. It's not conspiracy, but it's it's feeding you. Like, if you like red sweaters like you're wearing a red sweater and you like it well you'll see more red sweaters and after a while you think they only make red sweaters so that's what the social dilemma is about you've seen it Lorreen. what in general like i said before not diving in too deep how do you see that what was your reaction when you saw as a social media manager as someone who's full-time into into the, the online world what was your reaction to that documentary um well it definitely makes you think um there were a lot of um, things they addressed that we already knew that Facebook in general, social media knows a lot of info about you. Everything you clicked on, you viewed, you shared, even stores you went past by because of the internet connection and yeah. you know what. Um, so it definitely makes you think um, in what those social media channels could do with all the data that they have. Um, because there's also a very famous quote in, in that documentary is that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Exactly. And as a marketeer, we know that we, we are using that data. We are the, uh, the real client of social media because we're investing our money in to use their services. Um, and it's, as a marketeer, it's very beneficial, of course, because you can really um, make the most out of tailored advertising. You really know your target group the best possible way. And then you can also create content specifically for that one person, let's say. Um, and that's what makes it really interesting. But of course, the whole... Um, other side of it is that it makes you think in how far they can go with this data and how far they can really control um, those people. Um, but I just hope that people, and I think that people are more aware of the possible side effects that social media can have and that they also um, focus on really keeping that human connection and a human way of communication rather than to focus on um, what the negative sides of social media are. Yeah. Um, and also, um, in terms of the fake news, that people just will be aware of the fact that it might not be true what they're reading. And I think it's just our attitude towards social media and how we can use it differently and just keep engaging with friends and, and family and not just focus on the news that you get or the um, other messages that you receive. 
not really focus on that, but yeah, you, know, you can focus on it, but just to be aware of the fact that it might not be true and that it might be uh, something that you simply just not interested in. And it doesn't mean that if Facebook says it is, that it also that's that it's true. Just really to keep a clear mind and to clear, keep a clear vision on focusing on that in human connection rather than to get frustrated by it or um, yeah, to really focus on a negative, just keep focusing on that social aspect of social media, um, but keep a clear mind to what everything that's, that's been said by news, by pages, whatever. Yeah, you have to stay critical. And I know that's not easy for everybody, but like, for example, me, this, this Christmas holidays, I got Facebook off my phone because I saw that it was really getting me depressed with all the news and the COVID and half of it's not true because I check, I, I have this tendency to check because we have a lot of contact with a lot of organizations uh, around the world to just check, like, is this true? And most of the time they're like, I don't know where you're getting this news, but that is not true at all. Um, and I just got it off my phone. I feel so much better, but I am still on TikTok and Instagram. And I know Instagram is the same company. It's also Facebook owned, but on Instagram, at least I can follow people that inspire me through their crafts, through their singing, their dancing, through their, their, their storytelling, whatever they're doing. And you feel good. You feel inspired. You check with like-minded people. And, and, and it's, a, it's a great way to connect with people all over the world. So yeah, people should, it's easier said than done, but become more critical. Yeah, it's easier said than done. Um, I also notice in my behavior on social media is that if something makes me unhappy or I just don't like the news that I'm seeing. I just simply unfollow that page. Yeah, and it's it's yeah, it's a great feeling of of relief in in a certain way because you know it's there and I don't have to see it. You can easily choose yourself what you want to see and what you want to follow or what you don't want to follow. Um, so I've blocked a lot of pages. I I deleted some friends as well. I deleted some accounts. I unfollowed some people because I knew if I just focus on that social engagement, the human connection with my friends, family, and people I want to follow and are interested in. Social media becomes a different uh, tool that you can use in that connection and not just in news or events or let's say any other page. Um, just, I think just our behavior and our view on social media has to change, but not necessarily that the company will change because they, because they won't. Yeah. But just your attitude towards it, if you focus on that social uh, engagement, with friends, with family, I think you're, you're okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like, like candy. I know we both like candy. We like candy a lot. And it's the same. If you go to the store and you buy candy and it's in your closet or your cupboard, you eat it. But if you decide in the store, I'm not going to buy it because if I don't buy it, I can't eat it. You protect it yourself. And you take exactly. It. <laughs> and Lorena's looking at me. I'm still taking the candy home. <laughs> uh, but that's good. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best way to, to approach that. And, and you're in the job of social media manager, bringing beautiful content into the world where people can engage with their favorite brands and uh, wish each other Merry Christmas. So that's the beautiful part of social. Last question, Lorene. Like I said, last three, and I keep my word. You're a social media manager. If for the people listening right now don't know yet, we did something wrong in this uh, one and a half hours. Social media, you're working for Blue Zoo. I also put the link to the agency um, in the, in the, in the descriptions. So definitely reach out to them. If you have like, I have no clue, even though I got all these tips, if you're a young person and even maybe an older person doesn't really matter. There's no age, but I'm saying young person because most of the time social media management, because people grow up with it, um, are fairly young in the, in the business. So that's how I experience at least if someone's listening and like, Hey, this I'm a student and this really sounds like the job for me or you're doing something in marketing right now. We're like, Hey, why am I not a social media manager internally? How do you get, how do you roll into this job or, or what is, what, how can I become what you're doing or what should I be doing? Or how do I become the next Loreen in social media? That's a oh. deep question for the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah. It's because I, if I think back on how I became a social media manager is, um, well, the thing I like about social media management is that it's both analytical as it is human. Mm -hmm. And I think that analytical uh, aspect of it is something that's from my school when I was 14 or 15, mm -hmm. I was always studying in science and math because I really admired the fact that in science and in math, things are just black and white. It's yes or no, it's correct or it's not incorrect. 
Um, and that was something that I really interested in and also to, um, to gain insights in how things actually work. So that's most the physics signs of it. So a tennis ball, for example, if you drop it on the floor, it bounces back up. Why does it do that? <laughs> so, I'm wondering the same thing. <laughs> so, so that anal analytical interest is always something that I, I've, I always wanted to pursue because I wanted to learn why things happen the way they happen. Mm -hmm. um, but science and math was too much studying for me. And so the other thing I really liked was communication. Um, before I even knew the term communication, but I really just knew that I liked presenting, I liked talking to people, I liked um, entertaining or performing uh, towards people because I knew if someone else is having uh, a laugh with something that I say or they feel better of something that I say, I really enjoy that feeling. Um, and um, so in social media management, I, I had to, the opportunity to combine those two interests. I had the opportunity to combine those analytical interests of um, those metrics, those instant feedback from the viewers that you invest in cost per click, click through rate. Um, so I had to, to combine that with also that human communication aspect um, of really creating relationship with people through understanding what people want, what they're related to, um, and to also wish a Merry Christmas to people, to gain it back, to really have that engagement and a relationship with people. And that com combining those two, the analytical and human way of communicating um, was what drove me in towards social media. Um, also the aspect, and I think that's something that young people would uh, find really interesting on social media is that it's not just a fixed job that will remain the same this week, next week, but not even next year. It's something that will keep evolving, keep changing. New features will be thrown into, features will disappear again. And you'll also have to keep learning, keep adapting and keep developing yourself. Um, and that's what makes it very interesting is that no week is the same as the week before or the week that will come. Never a dull moment in social Never media. a dull moment. <laughs> so if, if you like what she said in this episode, definitely reach out, let her know if you had some laughs and you got a lot of insight. I know I have, uh, and you can say, oh, Marty, you can say that because she's on our episode. It's true. You can just take the boxes here and go do your social media management. And if you want to go into the job, you like the metrics, you like to work with content, you like to build the relationships and you want to get Merry Christmases from the brands, the communities that you built, then that's definitely a job for you and reach out to Loreen. How can they reach you if you want to reach out or have more questions or maybe work with you? What's the best way? On social media. <laughs> On social media. I'll put her links in the description. I'll, I'll put your Twitter, your Instagram, your TikTok. People can look at the at the coin falling through the thing. So you get a 1.3 million and one views, uh, which is amazing. The internet connection is is giving in a bit. So we're probably running out of internet. So that's, that's the signal to wrap up. But I think we have a beautiful episode, a lot of insights. Hope this is also relatable content to the people that are listening. Also in Spain, hola. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lurine. Thank you so much for taking the time in your busy schedule. Also during your holidays, because I think you now have some time off. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. And then this guy comes with his podcast <laughs> and said you could be watching Disney, Disney movies. Um, yeah, in general, I really enjoyed this. So thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll probably have you over in some new episodes because like you said, social media just keeps evolving and new things coming up. And what's the next thing after TikTok? And depending on the reactions, we can dive into more stuff. Lorin, thank you very much for you people listening out there, out there in the world. Have great holidays if you're still having holidays. If you listen to this episode later on, just have a great week or have a great day. Keep making that content. And who knows, one day you might go viral with a sprinkle of luck. And remember, beans and farts are the key to success on social media. All the links, all the descriptions, everything Lorene said will be in the description. Ladies and gentlemen, I was Marnik Vandenbroek. My guest was Lorene Salas. This was a stand-up talk. Are you listening? Damn.